Recently here on Maximus Aviation, we featured her sexy little sister, the 757. But this video was all about the full-figured, glamorous older sister, the wide-body 767. Designed in the mid-1970s using state-of-the-art computer-aided design, the 767 pioneered the coming computer age of future aviation. Forty years later, she is still as glamorous as she ever was as she continues to move passengers and freight all around the world. The history of the 767 is next on Maximus. Boeing's four-engine 747 was famously introduced as the world's first wide-body commercial aircraft in the 1960s. It first flew in February 1969. Around the same time, McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed were working on a wide body of their own. However, these had just three engines. The McDonnell Douglas DC-10 first flew in August of 1970, and the Lockheed L-1011 first flew in November of 1970. Meanwhile, all the way across the pond in Europe, a startup company was working on the first twin-engine commercial wide-body jet in the industry, and that of course was the Airbus Corporation's A300, and it flew for the first time in October of 1972. It would be Airbus's innovative twin-engine design that would go on to become the industry's standard. At first, due mostly to rising oil prices in the 1970s, but also due to improvements in engine technology and design that made the idea of long-haul twin-engine wide bodies possible. For most of the 1970s, however, Boeing 747 remained largely unaffected by outside forces as she continued to rule the wide body market. However, by the mid-70s, the writing was on the wall, as the industry realized the twin engine was going to be the passenger jet of the future. In this new era of aviation, industry rule was operating cost over passenger capacity. Boeing understood this and they knew their customers were also looking for a twin aisle plane, just not something as large as the Jumbo 747. In the mid-70s, Boeing was looking for a replacement for its original groundbreaking narrow body 707. Boeing began working on not one, but two twin-engine airliners simultaneously. Boeing initially dubbed these planes as the 7N7 and the 7X7. At first, Boeing considered creating both the 7N7 and 7X7 as twin-aisle aircraft. However, they eventually made the right decision to keep the 7N7, or as we now know, the 757, a narrow single-aisle plane, and make the 767 Boeing's new twin-engine, long-haul, wide-body option. The 767 wasn't quite as wide as the 747. The 747 standard economy has 10 abreast seating, while the 767 would only feature 7 across. So where Boeing initially envisioned the 767 as the replacement for the 707, it was actually the 757 that would replace the 707 retaining its narrow body 6 across seating. Because Boeing was developing the 767 and the 757 concurrently, they both shared much of the same design materials and technology. One of the new technologies was the introduction of the glass cockpit. Boeing was the first to introduce computer screens to replace or duplicate many of the flight, navigation, and systems steam gauges as the pilots called them, referring to the old analog cockpit instrument dials. The 767 design process emphasized fuel efficiency from the outset. Boeing targeted a 20 to 30 percent cost savings over earlier aircraft, mainly through new engine and wing technology. The 767 was one of the first airliners to be developed mostly using computer-aided design. Nearly 70 percent of the 767's design drawings were achieved with computer-aided design. Another one of the 767's groundbreaking innovations was that even though the 767 was a wide-body jumbo jet, it only required a crew of two to fly her. The introduction of the cathode ray tube or the CRT replaced the role of the flight engineer by enabling the pilot and co-pilot to monitor aircraft systems directly. Even the Airbus A300, the innovator of the twin-engine wide-body commercial jet, required a crew of three. In total, the 767's combined program development costs were estimated at $3.5 to $4 billion. Early 767 customers were given the choice of Pratt & Whitney JT9D or General Electric CF6 turbofan engines, marking for the first time that Boeing had offered more than one engine option at the launch of a new airliner. 
The first 767 enters service with United Airlines on September 8, 1982, powered by the Pratt & Whitney JT-90 engines on the Chicago to Denver route. Three months later, Delta Airlines took delivery of their first 767-200, powered by the General Electric CF-6 engines. TWA and American Airlines followed soon after. Most of these aircraft were deployed on domestic routes within the U.S. However, the real glimpse of the 767's potential came when Boeing, seeking to capitalize on its new wide-body's potential for growth, offered an extended range model, the 767-200ER, in its first year of service. The 767-200ER entered service with El Al in 1984. It was with the extended range version of the 767 that Boeing realized the full potential of its new wide body. Flying up to 6,385 nautical miles, the increased payload and extended range of the ER solidified its role in becoming a long distance carrier. The 767 was a pioneer of twin jets across the Atlantic. In 1985, the FAA granted the first ETOPS 120 approval to the 767, extending the range for the aircraft's operational role. ETOPS stands for Extended Range Twin Engine Operational Performance Standards. So if you have an ETOPS rating of 120, that means your aircraft can fly up to 120 minutes from a suitable diversionary airport. The higher the number, the better the rating. In 1989, the FAA extended the ETOPS to 180 minutes, giving the 767 the ability to operate transoceanic routes, increasing sales exponentially. In 1988, the stretch version of the 767, the 767-300 and the 767-300ER were released with American Airlines as its first customer. Quickly, the extended 300 versions made up more than 65% of all 767s sold. By the mid-1990s, the 767 was Boeing's best-selling aircraft and most commonly used for transatlantic flights between the U.S. and Europe. In January 1993, following an order from UPS Airlines, Boeing launched a freighter variant of the 767 called the 767-300F. That entered service with UPS on October 16, 1995. The 767-300F featured a main deck cargo hold, upgraded landing gear, and strengthened wing structure. In 2000, it further stretched the fuselage, unveiling the 767-400ER, a type that entered service with Continental Airlines. A total of 1,181 767s were built and ordered by more than 70 airlines. Its largest operators were Delta with 77, FedEx with 60, UPS with 59, and United Airlines with 51. By the early 2000s, the writing was on the wall. The economic downturn meant airlines were searching for greater productivity from their long-haul aircraft. Thus, Boeing began working on a mid-sized 767 successor, which would be built from composite materials for a 20% greater fuel efficiency. This aircraft, of course, went on to become the 787 Dreamliner. In 2010, it looked like the end of the line for the 767. Then suddenly, FedEx placed an order for 27 767 freighters, then again adding 19 more in 2012. Then in 2015, UPS ordered 50 freighter variants with options for 50 more. However, the market for the passenger type had all but disappeared. But there were rumors that Boeing might restart production of the 767 for passenger use while awaiting a decision on the new NMA, but Boeing insists there will not be another 767 passenger variant. However, as far as the freighter versions are concerned, Boeing will continue to be busy producing them until at least 2025. Well, there you have it. The story of one of the most successful wide-body long-haul planes ever produced. Not quite as sexy as my favorite, the 757, but every bit as lovely and capable. How about you? What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comment section down below. And as always, don't forget to subscribe, share, ring the bell, and like. And as always, remember, leave the rubber on the runway and your troubles on the ground. And I will see you next time in the air. Yeah, this is Maximus.